Welcome back, everyone, to another edition of the Around the Block podcast from Coinbase. I'm your host, Justin Mart. This week, we are diving into a part two on metaverses, the interesting, bleeding edge, fun to think about concept that I don't think anybody really understands. So following our episode with Alex Reeve a couple weeks back, we are going to dig in this time on what is the investable opportunity in metaverses, how to think about the different categories that are emerging, what exciting innovations are coming down the pipe, what trends to look for, and in general, a different framework on what the metaverse is and how to think about it. So with me this week, I've got Janine Yorio. She is the CEO and co-founder of Every Realm. This is a, a metaverse invest, innovation and investment company backed by, among other people, Coinbase Ventures. So we're very excited to have her on and let's jump into it. I think a lot of people have different opinions and different perspectives on what the metaverse is. It's very much a buzzword. So what is your definition of the metaverse? So I think, uh, and the entire premise that my company, Every Realm, is built around is that the metaverse is a video game-like environment that is social, persistent, and where people can buy and sell things and earn money. What the metaverse is not is just a video game. It is not necessarily an alternate version of reality but it is a way for people to procrastinate and to do things in a social environment where there's also an in-game economy where they can buy things, sell things, and even earn income by participating. Hmm. Yeah, this is, this is a, a kind of where the, the buzzwords come into play too, right? So you said it's, it's like a video game, but it's also not like a video game. Can you expand on that a little bit? So I think a video game often has one stated objective, right? It's typically to earn the most points or to beat the to win um, whatever whatever the objective is of that particular video game. This is a video game-like environment, but there are many potential outcomes. And rather than there being one or one ultimate goal that everybody is working toward, there's a lot of user-generated content. People are doing different things. Some people are just existing. Other people are trying to rack up kills and do some mm -hmm. of the more traditional video game things. But there isn't just one way to win. It's a place to be. Um, and oftentimes while you're there, you're playing video games, but video games aren't the only thing that there is to do. Okay. Um, let me define emergent behavior because it feels like what you're describing is a little bit of emergent behavior, right? And to me, emergent behavior is this idea that you have some set of rules or some set of like foundational principles that govern an area or a universe or something. And then the people inside that area more or less interact with it in surprising ways. Mm -hmm. The complex behavior sort of emerges from that. So Maybe what I heard there was, you know, there is sort of a set mission or objective. You can drop into this, you know, digital realm and there are going to be some sort of quests or objectives to pursue, some sort of ultimate narratives to go after. But the real important thing here is maybe there's just an emergent behavior that happens where, where we all collectively kind of decide on different side quests or, you know, things kind of pop up out of out of nowhere, right? And it's just this emergent kind of phenomena. Yeah, I don't know that that's the, the core defining characteristic of what I think a metaverse is. I think what makes this different from previous, uh, more traditional video games is this concept of an in-game economy. So it's it's an in-game economy that's persistent. When you turn your computer off and then come back, it's still there and, and it's still going and it was going even in your absence. And there's an opportunity to buy and sell things and also move the, the earnings you have outside of that ecosystem. So to easily transfer both the assets that you've acquired, like if, if you could buy skins and move them out of Fortnite, but also sell them inside Fortnite and move, move your earnings out in the form of a token or cash, that would be more like the metaverse that we're describing here today. Okay. The specific, yeah. the specific games and how it's gamified, I think there's going to be tremendous variability because as we know, that's exactly how video games work. Some people like playing first person shooter games, but a lot of other people like playing Candy Crush. And while they're both video games, they bear almost no resemblance to each other. But what they do have in common is they consume massive amounts of people's time. Uh, and that is the reason why people will go to the metaverse is to do these things that is their primary form of procrastination. But while they're there, they're going to sell, they're going to socialize, they're going to engage in e-commerce, and they're going to potentially even build businesses inside that economy. Yeah. Would, would, is it fair to say that the metaverse then, the way that you're kind of describing this, is still kind of like an escape from everybody's normal lives? Yeah. You play video games as an escape, right? So in this sense, it's, it's an extension of that, but it goes above and beyond it. Yeah, I think it's actually a mashup between video games and social media. What is social media? It's also, it's become everybody's favorite form of procrastination. 
it's, you know, we pretend like it's where we gather the news or see pictures of our, our nieces and nephews. But the fact is, it's just something we do when we're not doing the thing that we're supposed to be doing, whether it's paying attention at work or, or um, you know, passing time on your commute. It's this new thing that we do that, that engages our brain, but it's not terribly productive. And there's a lot of that in video gaming, and there will be a lot of that in metaverse as well. But that's an enormous opportunity for marketers because it's a new place to find people. And my thesis is it will become the primary place where people learn about new things, whether it's new products, it's new information, it's new behaviors, the same way TikTok has become a new way for people to find out about music and consumer products and fashion. So too will the metaverse be this place where people become informed. And that's that's an interesting, what you call emergent behavior. It's a cultural shift yeah. away, away from things like scheduled television programming, which is declining precipitously in importance when it comes to forming culture, um, but even more immersive than TikTok, where really the only way to engage is either to post a comment or to like. This is, you can actually walk inside and dance alongside somebody else. So it's it's as addictive as TikTok, as transformative in terms of its ability to create culture and cohesion across broad distances, but it's also interactive and hopefully therefore more socially redeeming. It's not quite as passive as just consuming short form videos. Yeah, that's, I think, a pretty helpful. So. I'll be honest, I'm kind of a little bit of a metaverse neophyte here. Like I don't, <laughs> I've, I've followed the space, I've watched it. I don't totally, like if you ask me what is the metaverse, and I talked to Alex Reeve about this and I got a clear picture on it, but I'm one of these people that loves to hear like concrete examples of what it might look like from user experience. And in my head now, I'm still struggling, like what is the exact user experience? But what I will say, you know, if I reason about this at a high level, what you're talking about makes a lot of sense. What I'm hearing you say is essentially, look, the trend towards, you know, our digital lives becoming more and more ingrained with our real lives or, or you know, the core of our being, our personality, that's a clear shift that's occurring. You look at, you know, the, the adoption of smartphones. I mean, 2007, 2008, the iPhone comes out. Today, we're all basically zombies with smartphones everywhere. You know, we're on our smartphones all the time. Instagram has become just ingrained in our personal lives. And that trend is probably only going to continue. And the metaverse is maybe the next evolutionary shift towards that. Um, but maybe to make things more clearer for me, like, is there a user experience you can point to specifically an example of some sort and like how people would drop into a metaverse and what that might look like? First of all, don't beat yourself up. Everybody's a metaverse <laughs> neophyte. I don't think there are too many people who are truly expert, although there are a lot of people that purport themselves to be, including me, and it's all I talk about every single day. The space is so nascent and so rapidly evolving that even if you think you know what's happening, if you miss a few weeks, your information is stale. So that is the state of the metaverse, and I think that's always the state of early stage, but very well capitalized new concepts, and the metaverse is definitely in that category. The second is, do I have an example? So I think that the best existing example of what a metaverse can look like is Roblox, which is, you know, difficult for adults to extrapolate from because it's obviously targeted toward fairly young children. But it is this immersive social experience that incorporates voice and text chat alongside video games in lots of different potential environments and configurations. But there's also this concept of e-commerce where creators can both buy and sell things, but also earn money for making things. What's missing from Roblox is adult-focused content and the crypto layer that would make it easier for people to buy and sell things and then move those earnings outside of that ecosystem. But that's the best, um, I think, most evolved uh, metaverse that exists. Then you have projects like Decentraland and more of the recent metaverses, which, in my opinion, are more like proof of concept and demonstrate the potential for the metaverse, but they've failed to gather the traction and user base that I think is truly compelling to the adult community. That's because I think a lot of their content hasn't fully embraced the notion that the reason why people are going to come to the metaverse all the time is to play video games. A lot of the developments in Decentraland are just digital twins of buildings that exist in real life, which you go see it once and there's nothing to do. It doesn't, it doesn't have that hook that you would have with a video game that makes you come back over and over and over again to achieve different levels and move through it. So it's not that the technology is bad. I think it's not as evolved as it's going to be or as the winners will be as this, as this category continues to mature. Yeah. So back to the Roblox example. Um, I admit I've never played Roblox. Well, I'm you're, imagining you're not, not, you're not nine years old. Yeah, that's a fair point. <laughs> not really the target demographic on that one. Um, but is, is there like, you know, again, like a set objective in, in Roblox or what does the guys got gameplay look like there? There are all different games on Roblox. So it's not just one game. It's, it's, it's like steam in the sense that it's a, it, it's a discovery space where you can see lots of different games. Um, 
I happen to have children who do play Roblox and among the more popular games are, there's a game called Adopt Me where you trade dream pets and they're actually called NFTs, which stands for not for trading, but there's a lot, it, they don't stand for non-fungible token. Right, right, but not confusing a, at all, yeah. Not confusing, <laughs> no, clearly no intent to, uh, to confuse children, but there's this same concept of trading uh, collectibles that have different rarities and scarcities and then trading with your friends to get the best possible one. And I think at any given time, the best one changes out. I think it, at one point in time, it was a unicorn and they've you know, changed it so that the quest is never ending and that you can never have the best one because the best one is a moving target. There are games where you, they are more like a digital simulation, more like The Sims, where you build a house and you try to have a job and you can earn money in the form of points and Robux. And the objective there is just to get rich so that you can buy more things in this world and build a more lavish house and um, invite your friends over and have social experiences in this space that's palatial or like a mansion. Yeah. So different objectives for different environments, but not necessarily indicative of what adults will do when they spend time in the, the metaverse, but I think certainly emblematic of how diverse the experiences will be in the metaverse. And those children that play Roblox, they will grow up. Now, they may not always want to collect dream pets, but they're also, I think, demonstrated that they believe that this is a perfectly natural way to socialize with their friends in these video game-like environments. And for them, a 2D website that scrolls is not as compelling as a 3D web space that they can step into and be social and be with other people, which is a new behavioral shift. And that's yeah. where I think things start to get really interesting. Yeah, yeah. It, it's kind of like we're, we're iterating on the concept. It's kind of combining the concept of baseball cards, trading cards, rarity, and, you know, even art to a, to a degree with gaming and now with the digital world and with, you know, online experiences. Yeah. Immersive online experiences. It's a, it's a confluence of so many different trends that are happening simultaneously. Obviously, we're here to talk about crypto and that's an important piece. And there are DAOs and there's GameFi and there's this emergence of crypto-based gaming. But there's also um, the popularization and mainstreaming of, of video game culture, video games becoming actually a source of culture creation where you have world-class acts that are actually releasing albums and singles in the metaverse because it is the new it's replaced mtv in terms of cultural re relevance you used to you know launch launch your music video on cable television and that's no longer as relevant because that next generation doesn't watch cable television they've all unplugged so it's kind of becoming the new online social space what's magical about it is that it's truly global it's accessible to everybody. It's not Western centric or European or, or American. I mean, if you think about it this way, Axie Infinity came from Vietnam, Decentraland came from Argentina, the Sandbox was designed by a team from France. It's very global and inclusive from that perspective, which means that we can create culture inside them or at least disseminate it on a truly global scale, which I think is really exciting and, and you know, hopefully yeah. breaks down breaks down barriers and makes us all friendlier toward each other. Yeah. Um, I, I'm reminded that, you know, the things to pay attention to in crypto and probably life in general are the stuff where you look at and you go, hmm, that seems weird and odd. I don't quite get it, but it looks like it's tapping into some core element of human psychology. We've got mm -hmm. groups of people that are really deeply connected to it. This is one of those things where it feels like there's some magic here, even if I don't fully understand it today. I think that's, I think that's right. I think we saw that with the rise in popular popularity and NFTs and how the whole NFT space has taken a very different turn from what we would have expected at the outset. If you recall, the NFT craze really began uh, in a more mainstream way with Beeple, which is this really high-end art sale. And the metaverse can take that to the next level, where instead of just having this figurative community that exists, exists in 2D chat environments like Twitter, where you can actually take your bored ape and go to the other side and hang out with your friends who are also apes and punks and mebits together in this virtual world. And, and yeah. you bring people that are, again, global, but but united by this reverence for, for their ape, which there's already a lot of affinity for. Yeah, it, it's fun talking about it because it doesn't make sense when you first mention it, but then when you experience it. When you own an entity, when you get part of the community, it becomes so real. It's, well, it's crazy the shift that happens. Well, and I think the way to easy, the more easy way to understand it is think about how you feel when you don't have a board ape, right? I mean, you're, you're <laughs> the on the outside <laughs> looking in and you're wondering, what am I missing? This thing, you know, not only is it valuable and it's cool, but like what, what conversations am I missing by not having one of these things? And that yeah. really gives you a sense of how strong these communities can be. So let me ask you the totally, completely unfair question. What will the metaverse look like in like 20 to 30 years? 
20 to 30 years. I don't know. I mean, Maybe who, even 10 years. I don't know. Let's, I, let's I can't even bit. predict where I'm going to be, you know, on vacation in six months. So I think let's think about where it's going to be in two years. I think we're going to see a very a much broader definition of what the metaverse is. Um, it's not going to just be the ready player one version of the metaverse where it's first person shooters and it's about war and dystopia and sci-fi. It's about persistent social environments that are social and interactive, and they're going to look increasingly photo real and less cartoonish and less like a video game and more like something that people who are looking to make real social connections, like maybe even find love or buy products where it's important to see what they look like. Uh, you'll be able to do that in the metaverse. And we know that this is coming because we have AAA gaming studios that have been building in stealth for a while, building projects exactly like this that are scheduled to launch in the next 12 to 24 months. Uh, now, just, just to be clear, right, there's not going to be one metaverse to rule them all. There's going to be many different metaverses. And maybe a core component you mentioned earlier is the ability to take kind of your assets, if they're NFTs or digital you know, goods, from one metaverse into another one. It's persistent, it's interoperable, but it's not that there's one winner. It's that there's going to be many different metaverses. I agree. I think that there will be, for me, the easiest way to understand what the metaverse looks like in the future is just to replace the word metaverse with the word internet. So it's going to be a vast interconnected network of spaces, and that's the metaverse. And then a metaverse is kind of like a website. So some metaverses are going to be like Google in that they have hundreds of millions of users and hits a day. But other metaverses might be much more specialized and smaller, but no less important at very specific points in people's lives. And they they will exist, but they just don't won't get the same traffic as some of the bigger ones. So I think there's going to be a few that are massively popular and do gain mainstream adoption, but there'll be thousands, if not millions of smaller, more niche ones set up for all different kinds of communities and geographies and different psychographic groups of people that decide to congregate online. So let's let's shift gears a little bit here. Um, would love to hear a little bit more about what Every Realm is, what you guys do and kind of how it's set up. And then I want to talk about your investment thesis in metaverses and dig into kind of how you guys view the the investment opportunities there. So Every Realm is a metaverse and investment company. We manage a couple of investment vehicles that invest in metaverse companies. Um, those are metaverse platforms like some of the ones we've mentioned today and um, also investing in metaverses that haven't launched yet. So of the 27 metaverses that we hold investments in, only seven of them are actually live and most of them are still in beta. So the industry is still very young. We also build things on um, a lot of the metaverse real estate that we own. We build projects that are meant to be metaverse adjacent or eventually to be parts of metaverses that are soon to launch. We've also incubated companies. We have a gaming guild. We're forming an esports league. So all these different components of the metaverse ecosystem are things that we touch at every realm. And I see us as a holding company for the metaverse with lots of interesting portfolio companies and pieces of those companies, in addition to being a full stack studio that can add a lot of value to those platform companies by bringing brand partners in, um, helping them to think about their crypto strategy, helping them with distribution and building ultimately what I believe is an extremely valuable portfolio of assets. Okay. So I want to dig into a lot of this um, yeah. because it sounds like you're more than just an index on the metaverse. You're actually going to be rolling your sleeves up and kind of digging around and extracting value in different places. But to get some foundations in place, like what is your perspective on where value will accrue in the metaverse? So I think kind of the same way that value accrues in any nascent industry, it will be the infrastructure layers that connect a lot of the disconnected uh, players. I do believe the space is going to evolve very rapidly in the metaverses that we're all talking about today, we may or may not be talking about in 12 to 24 months. Being able to bridge those shifts and bring users across all the different metaverse platforms in one agnostic layer, which is infrastructure and about being the tools for the metaverse, is I believe the most um, risk adjusted place to play in the space that also offers these kind of log logarithmic returns we're all looking for. So is there a real estate component here too? Yeah. So, so that's the infrastructure side. What else is there? Yeah. We actually started as a metaverse real estate investment company. And that's what what we started doing um, a little over a year ago when we started building this company that today has become Every Realm. We still have that business. We continue to invest very actively in metaverse platforms that have a real estate component. We also build things on that real estate, which I think is a really interesting business. Basically, that means that we build video game environments or games within a game on top of other existing metaverse platforms. So we have in-house 
architects, 3D designers, game developers, all of whom can help us build spaces for communities in the metaverse on the metaverse real estate that we own through our investment vehicles. Okay. And so to break this down, actually, so the, the, the idea of owning metaverse real estate is that you are maybe basically responsible for cultivating the value of that real estate. Uh, you yeah. own it in a certain metaverse, but it's up to you to kind of create a user experience or shops or you know games or what have you that would bring people in. Yeah. And I think that's really important because if metaverses are only, if, if they sell real estate and that real estate is only owned by speculators, oftentimes it ends up being very barren and then there's nothing to do, which that's a terrible user experience. And it's very, going to be very difficult to overcome that shortcoming. So we feel like as evangelists for the metaverse category, it was important for us not to just speculate, but actually to participate and to build spaces that are conducive to bringing entire communities into these metaverses and being very thoughtful and intentional about what kind of content we think is going to bring people back over and over again. So for example, um, we did a project with Atari where we sold NFTs and then um, you know, built a discord around that, which was a very eye-opening experience for us. And then we subsequently started building for that project in the metaverse. So we just announced last week, we built an arcade where people can play some of the classic Atari games. And now there's a space in portals, which is a metaverse that will be built to accommodate the Every Realm arcade. So it was this transition from an NFT that was of dubious utility that now today has unlocked all these different experiences, some of which are in web two, but which ultimately will also be in web three. Yeah. Uh, back to this land concept though, right? So, I mean, I, I think it might be, um, I'm wondering how metaverse real estate is different from physical real estate. Uh, well, and like, it, you know, I mean, it, are there like, are there the key differences? Actually, yeah, just how is it different? Are there key differences there? What do they look like? I actually, for a while there, I was on this um, bandwagon of trying to convince people not to refer to metaverse real estate as metaverse real estate, because I feel that the name is very confusing. And it actually leads people who work in traditional real estate to think that they have some sort of special skills. It's also particularly confusing because I come from the traditional industry, real estate industry. So it's it's me being very um, hypocritical. But metaverse real estate is the space inside a video game like environment and speculating in it requires not just an understanding about how to buy and sell real estate, but how to assess the quality and viability of a very early stage technology company, which is incredibly risky. So it's not just about buying land and, and hoping that it gentrifies, but you actually have to believe the team that's responsible for building the platform can deliver and innovate and build something that's unique and compelling and that will actually be able to attract users repeatedly, which is very different from buying real estate in a neighborhood that's up and coming and, and you know waiting for the neighborhood around it to develop. And so you can't just speculate in the real estate, at least not intelligently, without also looking at the quality of the team and what their track record has been and whether we think they're likely to be able to deliver on these very grandiose visions. Yeah, they have to, at minimum, deliver on the playground by which people can then innovate and build experiences on top of the land. It's very multi-layered because there has to be this base layer of foundational metaverse, but also this concept of easy to use um, builder tools for all the user generated content, which is actually really complicated. So, and then on top of all that, you have to make people come and make people return. So there's this marketing and distribution component that's also very nuanced. Zooming, zooming out a little bit too, <laughs> helping me flesh out the bits and pieces here. Uh, I'm assuming there's going to be different sort of flavors or types or categories of metaverses. And I mean, just my, you know, again, neophyte type of understanding here. We have Mark Zuckerberg building whatever the heck Meta is doing in this more curated environment. Mm -hmm. You have Decentraland building more open and, you know, building block type metaverses. And you have Roblox, which already has a game involved. Like there's different categories at play already. Mm -hmm. So can you trace out the different categories of metaverses that exist? And then I would love to hear your thoughts on like which ones are most exciting to you and why. Well, most of the ones that exist today are all fairly similar. There are um, builder tools that allow people to customize fairly straightforward um, developments. So I think the most exciting of them today is probably the Sandbox. They have, they have done a very good job of attracting brands um, and giving people a taste of what's to come. They still haven't officially launched yet. And so we still don't know exactly what it's going to be like, but they have allowed users to participate in short alpha testing periods. So we have been able to get a sneak preview. Um, I think that's a particularly exciting one. Um, a lot of the others, Decentraland, Crypto Voxel, Somnium Space, they look similar in that there are these somewhat futuristic uh, maps that can be built on. Uh, some of the ones that we're excited about, I know we're really excited about Mona. Um, we're building in portals, like I said, for the arcade. 
we try to think very long term and long term in metaverses, you know, 12 to 18 months, what's coming next, not just building on the metaverses that we know about that are already live, but building an anticipation of the launch of future metaverses. So we have relationships with the founding teams on a lot of different metaverse platforms. And we see every realm as a way to connect to lots of different metaverses through one point of contact. And that's us. So we don't just build in one place, we build in every place, hence the name of our company. And we have both the inside um, connections in order to facilitate, but also the technical expertise to actually do so. And so how do you view Roblox? Oh, I think it's huge. Um, I think, you know, it's not crypto based. So um, it's a bit different than what we're talking about today, but it's certainly proven that there's a huge demographic that wants to do this it is very young. I mean, it skews toward very young children. People tend to age out of it, you know, and, and I keep hearing anecdotal data that older and older people are playing it, but the preponderance of users on, on Roblox are young. They're like under the age of, I, I believe 12, and please don't quote me on that. I didn't research the statistics, but they, they skew very, very young. But I think they've proven out this concept that um, there is a, a, it is a category. It can work quite efficiently. Um, figuring out how to deal with people as they age up and age out of it, I think, is the next the next big challenge for metaverse as a category. Yeah, the re reason why I asked, right, is Ro Roblox seems like it's a bit of a, an outlier from you know the Decentraland and uh, Somnium space and others in the sense that it's a centralized company mm -hmm. building a curated product with mm -hmm. gaming as its core feature today. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking about the concept of a metaverse because we can see how Roblox could shift into being a metaverse, right? Mm -hmm. If they you know make it more open or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the question here is, you know. The ones you've highlighted, they're still in beta, they're still in development. But we talked earlier about how you know you need a hook to get into these metaverses, and it's mm -hmm. often going to be around gaming. Mm -hmm. And so my naive assumption here is that the thing you're looking for on these different metaverses is that hook. People mm -hmm. to come in and start building the hook that gets users engaged and involved. Is yep. that a fair thing to say? Is that kind of what's uh, missing so far? A hundred percent. And it's and it's thinking about you know it's kind of like what happened to Mark Zuckerberg back when he figured out that the social feed and likes were the ways to get people to come back over and over again and keep checking in and it's what is that thing that's going to give people a repeated dopamine hit so that they come back more than they ought to um, and that this becomes this guilty pleasure that we all enjoy I mean do we have any early indications of <laughs> what that yeah, might look like I mean, or things that are being built again I, I go back to my core thesis which is video gaming is what people go to the metaverse to do and we already have a generation of video game addicts, and they're not just young. Um, the the statistics in terms of mainstream adoption of gaming over the last decade has been up and to the right, and it's becoming more female, and it's becoming older, and it's not so fringe, and it's not something that you have to do, you know, under cover of darkness in your parents' basement. People are being fairly open about admitting that they're a gamer well into their adult life. Mm -hmm. And I believe that that will become even more mainstream as this next generation starts to become adults as yeah. well. The underlying question here is, you know, how early are we? Like, are, is this just like very, very early? Or again, you said next year we might see some real metaverses emerge, so. Well, let's be clear. There are real metaverses that exist today. Um, there are Web2 metaverses, both for children and adults. There, there are Web2 metaverses that have been around for over a decade. This, this concept of the metaverse is not entirely new. I think what we're talking about is the new version of the metaverse, where it is crypto-based, it is built on the ethos of Web3, where there's this creator economy, people are paid to participate, um, and where I think the future has us... Um, what we're looking forward to are the more photo-real environments that do have better in-game uh, playing playing experiences for the players. And that's the next evolution. I don't think it's too early. I think, you know, we're talking on a crypto podcast to a group of early adopters who are very comfortable with risk. This is not a mature industry where you should expect to get a, a, a return that's slow and steady. It's going to be very volatile, but that's what people came for. That is the, the allure of crypto generally. And I do think meta, Metaverse in many ways may end up being the killer app for crypto. We thought it was NFTs. Um, and I think we've, we've seen how that's been so transformative. But just think if a mainstream audience starts trading things inside video game environments regularly and lots and lots and lots of small transactions, then ultimately Metaverse may, may end up being the killer app for crypto or one of the major use cases. So I think getting in early has its allure. It's not for everybody, but it is for some people. And that's who we exist for. 
Yeah, and it does sound like you're kind of positioning every realm to be able to shift with the trends that might shift as well. Again, you're you're building infrastructure and mm -hmm. putting down early bets on kind of different real estate opportunities. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit too, though, because I actually don't think a lot of people explicitly talk about this enough. We spend a lot of time in crypto podcasts pontificating about the future and you know all the amazing possibilities in crypto and whatnot, but there's not a lot of mention of risks and failure modes. So metaverse is a very early concept, right? We're pontificating on this interesting grand future. But in your mind, what are the failure modes? What are the real risks that that industry is still facing today? Part of the reason why we've taken such a broad diversified strategy is because I think it is difficult to predict consumer behavior one, two, three years out. We don't know exactly which metaverses will find favor because people are fickle. So there's that, you know, which, what does the metaverse end up looking like? Is it photo real? Is it more feminine? Is it a first person shooter game with a social component? I don't think anybody knows for sure. We, even when we've watched how video games explode in popularity, I don't think any of us would have predicted among us coming out from nowhere, seemingly nowhere and kind of taking the world by storm that's the nature of anything built in the video game world where different things capture popular imagination at different times. I think there is also the risk that a lot of the early players may have gotten the order of things a bit wrong. There has been uh, a wave of metaverse companies that issued tokens before the product was ready or long before the product was ready, which makes for a very hostile environment amongst their holders who want to know repeatedly, where is it? You know, you sold me this token. Where is this thing? And like I said, there there needs to be this patience with this category. Building a metaverse is not something that's going to happen overnight. And so the companies that I think still have very strong vision and strong teams, but sold tokens uh, very early are now dealing with the consequences of that. Yeah, it's an important point that you can get a lot of adopters to your project or community by, you know, launching a token, NFTs, et cetera. But that community is also very fickle. Yeah, they're they're almost like mercenaries in a sense, where they're going to go to wherever the value is. Yeah, um, well, you that's need to why... have both, right? You need to have token and a good project that gets people excited about it. That's why I think the metaverse needs to be about the user experience. It shouldn't be about speculation. It shouldn't be about just land speculation for the sake of watching the land price go up. It should be rewarding the creators who are going to build awesome things for people to do when they visit the metaverse and figuring out how to stimulate those economies and making sure that those people get preference when there is um, there is a time when land or, or the ability to, to build content is being distributed. Cool. All right. I feel like I'm a little bit more of an expert now. <laughs> Less of a neophyte, more of an expert. Less of a neophyte. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind Great. of the goal, right? Yes. Bringing everybody along, less of any fight. Um, well, hey, maybe last question here. You know, if I want to get involved with every realm or just metaverses in general, like what advice tips do you have for me? So I think it's important to try to do your homework. I always say there's a lot of lazy journalism floating around around metaverse. And if you only read what you can find at your fingertips, I think you'll you'll end up only skimming the surface. We actually have an online educational program called Realm Academy, where we have industry experts and university professors who teach a class about the metaverse and it's designed for people who want to go a bit deeper and be a bit more academic and research oriented with their approach to learning about metaverse. It's very suitable for people who are looking to kind of change careers or become the metaverse expert inside their company. Um, and we That's free? It's not free, unfortunately, but it is widely available. And our first cohort of graduates, we had 500 students who graduated in February, um, people really liked it. And we actually hosted some of the classes in the metaverse about the metaverse. And they built a metaverse campus. There were metaverse parties. People really liked it. And I think it actually is a really interesting use case for things that work well in the metaverse. You know, there have been use cases that aren't great in the metaverse, like music concerts are not great in the metaverse. The sound quality is not great. But online learning and learning in this immersive environment actually works really well. And people didn't find that the that the interface was disruptive or or eroded the quality of their education, which I think is exciting and promising. And we'll be rolling out not just Realm Academy, but future iterations of other online learning experiences that will happen in the metaverse over the next couple of months. Awesome. Okay. I'm going to check this out. Yeah. Realm Academy seems like a great place to get a little bit more in depth on what's happening in metaverses. Yeah. Um, and I guess maybe the subtext to all this too is, hey, play around with the ones that are available, look and see what they're building, yeah. become you know active in their discords, yep. roll up your sleeves, do the work. Right? Yeah. It's a lot of work, but if that's, if that's where you think you want to make your name, I think it's important to actually do the work. Well, that was part two and probably going to be a part three, part four, part five at some point down the road. What a fun, fascinating, interesting concept and topic of conversation. But there you have it, another edition of the Around the Block podcast from Coinbase. I'm always curious, did we ask the right questions? Did we dig into the right things? 
comment, tweet at me. I'm J underscore Mart 199 on Twitter. Also rate and review. If you're enjoying the podcast, we'd appreciate a rate and a review as well as catch us up on the web at coinbase.com slash around the block, where you'll find past podcast episodes, in-depth research, and much more. Catch you all next week. See you then. Today's conversation is for informational purposes only and does not constitute legal or investment advice. Actual results may vary materially from any forward-looking statements made and are subject to risks and uncertainties. 